Miigwech. Thank you. It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Kewetanong. Miigwech. Thank you. Elder care and long-term care in Sulakaut and Kiwetanuk is not meeting the needs of our communities. The lack of new long-term care beds in Sulakaut has led to emergency department and hospital beds being used by those who would otherwise be in the long-term care. Will Ontario ensure the elders of Kuwaitnuk have access to the care and resources they need? And that there will be funding provided to, to, to build the extended care. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. You know, some things are bigger than politics, and I believe that's one of those moments this morning. Miigwech to the Honourable Member for that question. Um, Speaker, what's bigger than politics also is making sure that we took, take care of those who took care of us. I'm, I'm also honoured to see that the member's mother is here. Happy birthday to her. Uh, I can see how important yes. I can see how important his mother is uh, to the member, and Speaker, certainly no difference in my life. My mother's a senior now. We have to take care of them. There's a moral ob obligation to do that. And while we have a larger capital plan to build and redevelop 58,000 new spaces in Ontario, we understand there are unique challenges when it comes to rural northern areas, particularly when it comes to Indigenous communities. Speaker, That's why our government has specific programs catered towards Indigenous communities. I was just in Tamiskaming Shores to announce 128 new spaces, uh, predominantly for the Indigenous Response. communities. They are part of a larger plan, 18 projects associated with First Nations, Speaker, 997 new, 221 upgraded beds. But we're going to continue to work with that member to make sure we address the needs in Sulu. Thank you. Community members in Sula Code have organized sending letters, postcards, and petitions to this government. Not only uh, the, the Aboriginal people of that com community of Sulakaut, but also non-Aboriginal people. They have been sending letters, postcards, and petitions to the government. All of this advocacy just to ask this government to fulfill a promise that they themselves made. Speaker, waiting is not acceptable when the problem is getting worse. The 76 beds promised in 2018 will not meet the need of 100 beds needed in 2025. So the beds that were promised the 76 bids promised 2018 are, are not met yet. Will this government please explain why these long-term bids in Sulakot have been delayed for six years and counting? Respond, Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, so the first thing I'll offer to the member opposite, uh, I know this is a hugely important issue to that member, it is to me as well. Come to my office and we can go through the process together and the challenges that are facing the allocation of 76 that are outstanding. Now, Speaker, while we work on the challenge of Sioux Lookout, we have uh, produced results when it comes to the Indigenous communities through long-term care, and I look to Niagara Falls, 32 new spaces, uh, Toronto Centre, 128 new spaces. As I said, Speaker, 18 projects, 997 new spaces, 221 redeveloped spaces specifically for First Nations. I want to go back to, to Ms. Ming Shores, Speaker speaker when I was there, talking about Indigenous services delivered in native languages with culturally appropriate care. 
This is hugely important to me. I come from a culturally diverse background. I understand the importance of that in your life. Our seniors deserve to live out their golden years, understanding, speaking the language that they spoke, eating the foods that they're accustomed to. This is hugely important to the Premier and to this government. Speaker, I commit to work with that Response. member to make sure that we get this done for Sioux Lookout. Please come to my office. We'll continue this journey along the path to building those 76 new spaces. Speaker, I am joined today with my mother, Kiza. Elders like my mother and other elders should not have to wait seven years to access a long-term care bed in Sioux Lookout. The system is failing them. It is not too late for this government to finally expand the long-term care facility that people across Kuwaitnuk have been waiting for for far too long already. Will the government finally come through on their 2018 promise to create 76 more long-term long care beds in Sioux Lookout? When? To reply, the Premier. No, oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, folks wondered what I was saying to you, Saul, and sorry for using your first name, but this is, this is a different situation. I had you in my office yesterday, told you how proud I am of you, how you're blazing a new trail, you know, and no one's ever done this, what you're doing today. And I just want to tell you, tell you that how proud I am of you, how proud everyone here in the legislature, how proud everyone in the First Nations. And I, I appreciate your passion in Sioux, uh, Sioux Lookout. I went up to Sioux Lookout, and you remember I went up there, and I committed that I'm going to build that long-term care home. I'm committing today in the public. We will be building those beds. We'll be building a home for Sioux Lookout. So thank you. The next question, I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, uh, it, is, uh, it is indeed a uh, historic day here in the Legislature. Uh, I want to uh, use this opportunity to raise another issue of great concern to so many people across this province. And this question is for the Minister of Environment. Yesterday, the Opposition Deputy Leader, the member from Quitnung, and I asked this government questions about the ongoing mercury poisoning of the people of Grassy Narrows First Nations. The Minister of the Environment answered that there was going to be a meeting today to discuss the findings. So my question is, can the Minister share details with this House on the scope of that meeting? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday about the meeting uh, taking place today, um, one of the things that we also need to reflect upon is the fact that the first order of business for this government, one of our first acts when we formed government in 2018, was to correct a wrong. And that wrong was the issue uh, that is being questioned today. One of our first acts back in 2018 was to index the mercury benefit payments for people who had not seen increases for inflation in as many as 30 years, Speaker. We're committed to continuing to correct that wrong, and as a result, the people saw their monthly payment amounts more than double beginning of November 2018, in addition to the retroactive payments. We know that there is no quick fix or no quick solution, and many of these issues are historic, complex, and multi-jurisdictional. There is a Response. lot of work that needs to be done, Speaker, but we're dedicated to achieving progress on these issues. A supplementary question. 
Well, well, Speaker, I just want to point out it has been decades, decades, since the first mercury was dumped down river of Grassy Narrows. Now, generations have been left to experience the devastating effects of mercury poisoning, and they want answers, Speaker, and they deserve them. The people of Ontario want action on their behalf. So I'm going to ask the minister more specifically, will the premier be in attendance at that meeting today? Will the minister, what other members of cabinet will be at that meeting, and how long do the people of Grassy Narrows have to wait? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. And we take the challenges faced by the people of Grassy Narrows and Wegamong very seriously, and we want to achieve real progress in developing solutions that are led uh, to improve the outcomes and create prosperity, health, and strong communities for the people who live there. If you look at June 20, 2022, the Mercury Disability Board marked the opening of a new clinical space in, the Kenora, in Kenora, along with the successive launch of reform achievement clinics. But, Speaker, as I mentioned, more work needs to be done. And that is why our government remains committed to working with Indigenous communities towards remediation of mercury contamination in the English and Wagagoon rivers. As I mentioned, we have committed to several uh, studies, many of them Indigenous-led studies, uh, we're following those recommendations. Response. There's a meeting with experts and the panel that will be later today, and we'll continue to meet later this week as we move forward on progress on this issue. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, I would have hoped to hear from the minister that the premier, that the ministers, that the cap somebody else from cabinet was going to be attending that meeting. I mean, meeting after meeting after meeting. Come on, people are being poisoned. That's right. That's right. Children, yeah. elders are being poisoned. i got to tell you, Speaker, if this was happening anywhere else in the province of Ontario, kids were being poisoned by the fish they eat, the water they drink. This government, I would hope, would do something. It has come to my attention, Speaker, that none of the ministers since 2018 have even set foot in Grassy Narrows. I want to know when this minister or somebody else from this government is going to go to Grassy Narrows, is going to treat this issue with the urgency that it demands and stop the poisoning of the people of Grassy Narrows. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. And this, the, the, member, uh, the member raises uh, a point about the inactions that were taken by previous governments. And that's what I did mention is our first order of business uh, to, of this government was to correct a historic wrong. And our first order of business was to ensure that we do take action on a progressive path forward, uh, including the necessary supports and benefits and ensuring that they are marked to inflation and the necessary supports are there. And secondary to this is working with Indigenous communities uh, the expert panels and so, as, as has been the plan all along um, to remain committed to ensure that there is a significant path forward and this week proves um, a few uh, commitments that we have on a path forward but speaker as i mentioned this is a very complex issue it has it has been a historic issue it's multi-jurisdictional but know that this government will continue to correct, correct a wrong and have a path forward The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker, should have been an easy answer. We're going to stop the poisoning of the people of Grassy Arms. But anyways, uh, this question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the NDP revealed that the Premier's Chief of Staff, Patrick Sackville, was routinely using his personal email account to do government business. This matters, Speaker, because Mr. Sackville told the Integrity Commissioner under oath that he does not conduct government business on personal email. Well, today, Global News is reporting that Mr. Sackville was using his personal email as recently as late 2023. That's after the Greenbelt scandal broke. And that means that Mr. Sackville not only gave false testimony under oath to the Integrity Commissioner about using his personal email, but he then doubled down and kept using it, knowing perfectly well that it was wrong. So my question to the Premier is, when is he going to demand his Chief of Staff's resignation for giving false testimony? 
government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the question. As I said, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, Speaker, if uh, the leader of the NDP has any additional information uh, uh, that she would like to uh, share with the Integrity Commissioner, I uh, invite her. Uh, I invite her to do so, uh, Mr. Speaker. I have uh, full confidence in the Integrity Commissioner's ability to continue any uh, uh, investigation that he uh, he needs to do. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to work on uh, the priorities of the people of the province of Ontario, growing the uh, growing the economy, uh, uh, Speaker, building homes, building schools, uh, reinvesting in health care, transit and transportation, all of the priorities that the people of the province of Ontario elected us to focus on uh, back in, uh, in not only 2018, uh, Mr. Speaker, but in 2022. We'll continue to focus on those uh, priorities because building a bigger, better, stronger, safer province of Ontario is exactly what we've been focused on, and we will not be strayed from that mission, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Well, first of all, let me, let me inform the minister that don't worry, we have already sent all those documents over to the commissioners, and there will be justice. There will be justice for you one day. On October 17, 2022, Ryan Amato sent Mr. Sackville a list of criteria for removing lands from the Greenbelt on behalf of all of their insider friends, and that was sent to his personal email. The email was dated 10 days before the date that Mr. Sackville told the Integrity Commissioner, again, under oath that he was first briefed on the green belt removal criteria. He also said under oath that he had no knowledge of this email and he had no idea how Ryan Amato obtained his personal email account. Well, let me, let me shed on some light on that because now we know that Mr. Sackville routinely uses his personal accounts for government business, contrary to what he told the uh, integrity commissioner, again, under oath. So my question, and perhaps the Premier will, will get up and answer it this time, is question? I want to know, has the Premier spoken to his Chief of Staff about the consequences of giving information and misinformation to the Integrity Commissioner? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, look, Order. if, uh, if the, the Leader of the Opposition has additional information, and she says she has provided additional information to the uh, the integrity commissioner then i have full confidence in the integrity commissioner to undertake his review mr speaker Order. now uh, at the same time we are going to continue to do what is important for the people of the province of ontario look we inherited a government back in 2018 supported Order. by the ndp at every step of the way an, a, an economy that was faltering a manufacturing sector that had been the member for hamilton mountain energy crisis order. schools where kids were discovering as opposed to learning math 600 schools have been closed in every step of the way the NDP supported them. Now, the NDP were so prolific in supporting Member the, for the Ottawa, Liberals so that they also order. negotiated a 400 per cent increase in child care the That's the success of the, of the NDP. What are we Spons. doing? We have a plan to continue to rebuild the economy. It is about rebuilding infrastructure, rebuilding hospitals, schools, roads, bridges, and we're The next question, the member for Milton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. I'm proud to be standing here today in this legislature to bring forward the concerns of my constituents in Milton. <laughs> Speaker, due to the impact of rising liberal carbon tax, Milton residents are facing Order. unaffordable gas, groceries. Member will take a seat. Please take your seat. We had 15 minutes of respectful dialogue in this legislature this morning. Let's see if we can keep that up. Order. Order. The government side come to order. I apologize to the member from Milton for having to interrupt him. He can place his question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the time where the cost of living continues to rise, the federal government decided to take more money out of people's pocket by hiking this tax by 23% last month. Ontarians do not deserve this punitive, punitive tax speaker. Unlike the Liberals, our government is powering Ontario's growth with clean, affordable and reliable energy. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why the carbon tax does not 
cannot and will not bring us the energy efficiency that our government is achieving through our clean energy program. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Minister of Energy. A day of firsts here. Congratulations uh, to the member from Milton on his first question in question period. And uh, again, uh, I, I want to congratulate my good friend from Kiwetanung as well for uh, his words this morning in OG Cree. Uh, to me, he's known as Kitchi Adamush, so if the interpreter is still there, that means the big dog. And uh, we, we love the member uh, from, from Kiwetanung. Um, speaker, uh, speaker, we can. Uh, we can do this. We can have the energy that we need in our province for our growing economy without having this punitive tax that the member from Milton is talking about. And we're actually doing it. You know, a lot of firsts in this province. We're building the first new nuclear small modular reactor at Darlington right now. We're building the first large nuclear in the province in over 30 years. That's going to be happening out at Bruce, Mr. Speaker. We're building a beautiful transmission Response. line. Wate Nakinia Power is here. Uh, we, we see the the wonderful people. Margaret is here from uh, Wate Power, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things we're doing in Northern Ontario. And my Thank you. The supplementary question back to the member from Wilson. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is encouraging to see our government's progress in meeting Ontario's growing energy demand. More importantly, we're getting it done without imposing a costly carbon tax. Speaker, families in Milton and across Ontario are looking to enjoy summer months without having to pay more for food, food, fuel, and other necessities. We're asking the federal government to show some compassion and not burden Ontarians with another costly carbon tax hike. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting businesses, families, and workers in Ontario as we fight the carbon tax? Of energy. Thanks again to the great new member from Milton. Well, we're not imposing a tax, not a carbon tax, not any tax, Mr. Speaker. We're actually reducing the cost of living in the province with things like one fare and the transit system, you know, cutting taxes, cutting fees, uh, toll roads, they're all gone. And we're building the infrastructure that we need to support our growing economy. And one of my favorite events since becoming the Minister of Energy was with the member from Kiwetanung and the folks from Wate Nakinia Power in northwestern Ontario and Kiza, actually, in her home community of Kingfisher Lake First Nation. When I was there with the member and we linked that community to our green emissions-free electricity grid that we have in Ontario so they can prosper in places like Kingfisher Lake, North Caribou Lake First Nation, Waterman First Nation, and I actually look forward to joining the folks from Watte next month when we celebrate the completion of that project linking 16 Response. First Nations communities to our clean provincial grid. Mr. Speaker, those are just a couple of examples of how we can do this without Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Speaker, uh, the Red River Métis, Inuit, and Ontario First Nations are calling on Ontario to retract its 2017 identification of the six new historic Métis communities in the Ontario region. There was never any consultation with First Nations to recognize these new communities and areas and across Ontario where Métis never existed. Will the minister explain why his ministry refuses to share evidence with First Nations about these so-called Métis communities? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to congratulate uh, the member uh, on an extraordinary and historic day. Uh, way to go, Salt. I have met with the chiefs of Ontario as well as a number of uh, Indigenous leaders, uh, chiefs from across the province. I'm seized of this matter. Uh, there have been many discussions, uh, and my ministry, as well as a couple of other ministries, are gathering information uh, to provide uh, for, uh, for those chiefs at an appropriate time. Some of the elements of, these, uh, of this matter is, are before the courts, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but we will continue to uh, ensure that the uh, interests from Section 35 rights and so forth 
uh, of First Nations people in this province are preserved and protected. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Uh, Speaker, uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal and the Sur Supreme Court of Canada have said Ontario must consult First Nations about Ontario's attempt and to create new historic so-called Métis communities on First Nations lands. This government needs to consider their evidence. When will Ontario stop providing misinformation to proponents about consultation owed in First Nations territories to these Métis communities when there isn't any evidence they existed historically? Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, uh, as a matter of substance, this government has not recognized additional Métis uh, communities, Mr. Speaker, and there has been some historic basis in law for the recognition of the existing ones. That said, Mr. Speaker, we will continue uh, to work with the uh, First Nations leadership, particularly some that are here today, uh, who are, are addressing matters of potential new uh, Métis organizations and we will to, uh, uh, continue to support, preserve, and protect uh, the Section 35 and any other uh, rights, uh, as well as a robust consultation process with First Nations leadership, uh, Mr. Speaker, on any issues or, or opportunities related to this important question. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton North. This is awkward. Come see. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. I actually would love to be the member for Brampton North, uh, uh, but uh, such a great community. But uh, truly, my heart is with the people of Winter to come see. So. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Uh, there is fierce competition from across the globe to land job creating investments. And when the Liberals were in charge, Ontario wasn't even on the short list of places companies would consider investing and expanding it. In my community, Winter Tecumseh, was ground zero for the economic loss that resulted from that. Wow. By reversing the Liberals' high tax policies, we've made sure Ontario is top of mind for global companies who are looking for their next destination to expand in. And Winter Essex has renewed hope for the future. Question. But the federal government's carbon tax threatens the progress that we've made. It's as if they want to take us back to the days of the previous Liberal government where workers and businesses had to flee our province. That's right. Speaker, can the Minister please highlight how, by scrapping the carbon tax, the Liberals can follow our lead and create the conditions for economic growth? Good question. The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we just returned from a successful uh, mission to Korea and Japan, and I must say that we met with leading global companies who were intrigued by Ontario's success story. In our auto sector, we went from zero to $43 billion in new EV investments in just four years. We added over 700,000 jobs since we took office, including 25,000 just last month alone. None of that would have been possible if we hadn't reversed the Liberals' high-tax policies that chased 300,000 manufacturing jobs out of the province. We've reduced the annual cost of doing business by $8 billion every year, creating the conditions for businesses to succeed in these good-paying jobs. Speaker, we've shown the Liberals the way. Response? Lowering taxes to, is the way to new investments and job growth. We need them to listen and scrap the carbon tax. The supplementary. Back to the member. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And there's truly never a good time to hike taxes. Yes. But with the rising cost of living, and high interest rates, the Liberals have picked the worst time to continue to hike Absolutely. their carbon tax. Our government has taken action to lower costs for hardworking people of this province, while the Liberals continue to move in the opposite direction. It seems that every time our government moves to put a dollar back in the pockets of the people who earned it, the federal government announces a new tax hike to try and take it away. 
Their tax and spend ways are rooted in the Liberal belief that the government knows how to spend money better than the workers who earned it. They don't. Speaker, can the minister please explain why we believe the hardworking people of this province should not be penalized with a Liberal carbon tax? Here, here. The member for Don Valley West will come to order. The member for Niagara West will come to order. The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, in the first four months of this year, Ontario has added 80,000 good paying jobs. These are jobs that are being created in every sector, in every region of our province. We want these hardworking men and women who are fulfilling these jobs to keep more of what they earn. And that's why we've acted to put more money back in the pockets of these people by cutting the gas tax, introducing the One Fair program, removing the license plate renewal fees, and so much, much more. But unfortunately, Speaker, the Liberals are moving in the opposite direction by continuing with their carbon tax. We need the Liberals to listen to us. We've shown them the way that lower taxes is creating this economic prosperity. We want them, Speaker, to listen to us and listen to the hardworking Response. people of Ontario and scrap the carbon tax today. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, through you to the Premier. Every year, workers in Ontario are hospitalized because of heat stress. Some of them die. Last year, you carried out a consultation on new heat stress regulations, and you didn't increase protection for any workers. This year promises to be another summer of climate-driven record heat. You can increase protection for workers right now. Will you do it? The Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, um, Section 43 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act ensures that any worker in Ontario who feels that they're subject to unsafe working conditions has the right to reject work, Speaker. We're working across Ontario to ensure record investments to build the infrastructure of tomorrow. We've got working class men and women on the jobs working to build a better, stronger future for Ontario, Speaker, and they're protected by robust protections in the Occupational Health and Safety Act, I would add, that's been strengthened under this Premier, the leadership of this government. The supplementary question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, the dangers of heat stress at work are real. And without meaningful legislation, Ontario's workers will continue to face the threat of heat-related injuries sickness and even death. Everyone deserves to be safe in the workplace. Everyone deserves to come home safe from work when the day is done. The growing threat to human health and worker safety posed by climate change must be taken seriously. We need more than work refusals. My question, Speaker, will the Premier begin this crucial health and safety work by better recognizing heat stress under the Occupational Health and Safety Act? Mr. Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Again, Speaker, we've got strong protections in the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And, Speaker, we work uh, with our Prevention Council. We work with labour groups across Ontario, Speaker. Uh, there's also an element of common sense, Speaker. Um, and, and, Speaker, we're going to continue making the investments to support a growing Ontario. We've got countless men and women in building trades who I would add are now supporting this government, Speaker, because of the record protections, because of the steps we're taking to bring women onto job sites, removing barriers for women, for racialized communities, Speaker. We're going to keep doing that, keep strengthening the Occupational Health and Safety Act, continue to strengthen protections under the Employment Standards Act, Speaker, and ensure Ontario is a competitive province that is booming once again with record housing, record transit, Speaker, record investments in hospitals and schools, all of which are going to ensure a growing working middle class. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so the Ministry of Education asked the Toronto District School Board to submit business cases for schools that urgently need a renovation or a rebuild. The priority was for shovel-ready schools. The criteria included accommodation pressures, school consolidation, facility condition, access to French language schools. Nowhere 
In the list of criteria, do we see the requirement for the school to be in a conservative riding? But alas, that seems to be the main stipulation for success. Speaker, my question to the Premier, what? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Member will take your seat. Please take your seat. The member for Beaches East York has a right to ask a question, and I need to be able to hear what she's saying. Just, and I'll need to hear the reply from the minister, if there's a minister going to be reply. And I apologize to the member for Beaches East York. Please start the clock again. She, she has the floor. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. What was your actual criteria for choosing a school in Etobicoke as a capital priorities project when other schools were higher up on the list with more dire needs? To respond? <clears throat> to respond? The Premier. Well, let's answer the, the question straight up. Under your government, no schools were built. Matter of fact, 600 schools were closed. We have a growing population in Etobicoke. Kids are in portables. They need a place to go to school. And I know they cut funding under education under the, the, the Liberal government. I know they cut 600 schools. I know they fired teachers. Opposed to what we're doing, we're investing over $16 billion into building new schools over the next 10 years. And since Etobicoke was ignored, for 20 years under their government, they aren't being ignored anymore. They're going to be treated fairly like the rest of the province. Here, here. <laughs> member for Ottawa South, come to order. I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The supplementary question, back to the member for Beaches East York. Speaker, <clears throat> here is the TDSB list of capital priorities projects. Number one. Kappa Machkwe, Wandering Spirit School, a step forward for truth and reconciliation in Toronto Danforth. Number two, St. Margaret's Public School desperately needs a rebuild with a long-term care already partnering with them in Scarborough Guildwood. Number three, Secord Public School, the largest and oldest porta pack system and waiting for a rebuild since the Premier and I were at City Hall together. In my riding, Beaches East York. Number four. Etobicoke Centre Elementary, say no more. Fourth on the list, but with the golden ticket of having a, a Conservative MPP to trump all other criteria. My question to the Premier, whether it's hospital, long-term cares, or schools, why does the gravy train only stop in Conservative ridings? Oh. <laughs> to reply, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is, um, it's just flabbergasting to hear this question from the Liberal Party. Honest to God, are you, are you a revisionist that just came down to earth after cutting funding for capital, closing 600 schools, having the worst EQAO standards in Ontario history? <laughs> you are lecturing this Premier on academic success and building anything? <laughs> In Scarborough on Friday, in the NDP riding of Dolly Begum, I stood with our Scarborough colleagues to build a new, announce a new French elementary school for the people of Scarborough. It happened to be an NDP riding, but we don't care because we're investing in what matters to families. I've been in TDSB. I was in London with the member just sitting across. Talk to me. <laughs> and conclude your answer. Member across from me who actually attended a capital funding announcement in her riding, if you could believe it. Mr. Speaker, we're going to Thank you. I'll remind members that they need to make their comments through the chair. Order. The next question, we'll start the clock. Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex.
Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. The Liberal carbon tax harms hardworking individuals, businesses, and farmers. Speaker, people in my riding of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, and across the province rely on Ontario farmers to grow high quality and healthy food for them and their families. But the federal Liberals, supported by the Liberals members sitting here in this House, continue to disrespect farmers through their unfair tax schemes. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government is supporting men, women that are producing food for our growing population. It is time that all governments do the same. Mm -hmm. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House why farmers in Ontario want to see the carbon tax scrapped immediately? Thank you. To respond, stop the clock, stop the clock. Start the clock. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome to the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. I knew from day one we would see you here in this house. And to answer his questions, ladies and gentlemen, the fact of the matter is, as we heard yesterday from the President of the Grain Farmers of Ontario, they are being stressed. The emotional toll of liberal ideology is really becoming palatable. And last week, the Ontario Federation of Ag Agriculture actually just released results of a survey that said what worries farmers most across Ontario, from Essex to Cornwall to Atacokan, they are worried about tax burden. Speaker, I stand at this house every day proudly representing farmers across this province, but I stand in front of you today for the first time to say I'm worried. You know, the corn is barely popping out of the ground, and I'm hearing across the province Response. farmers worrying about the cost of drying that corn this fall. Yeah. The cost is going through the roof, Speaker, especially since the Liberal ideology saw carbon tax increase 23 per cent April 1st. It's a travesty. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question back to the member for Lansing, Ken Mason. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is disappointing that the federal Liberals seem to be more interested in taxing our farmers than helping them. Speaker, Ontario's agriculture and food industry contributes over $48 billion in our province's uh, GDP and, econo and an economy, representing more than 800,000 jobs. It's essential that our vital sector continues to grow and produce more food for our growing population and export markets. We cannot let the Liberals and their carbon tax continue to add unnecessary costs that reduce competitive advantage at our global level. They need to finally start listening and show for our farmers that some support instead of trying to tax them out of the province. Speaker, can the minister explain how our government is supporting Ontario farmers as they fight against this carbon tax? The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Absolutely. Again, as farmers worry about the afford affordability and worry about affording drying their, their grain corn later this fall, it's our government in Ontario that's listening and standing up programs that are addressing how we can assist farmers and our associated food and beverage industries continue to grow. I was so very proud when I joined the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, just last week when we celebrated a provincial investment of $2.4 million into Park Hill Meats. We're bringing processing close to the farmers, and that huge crowd that was there that included farmers that are going to benefit, we're celebrating our government under the leadership of Premier Ford. Furthermore, we have introduced a $25 million Agritech Innovation Initiative. We have a biosecurity enhancement Response. initiative. We also have a program to enable farmers to grow future opportunities. Again, Speaker, we are standing up programs that are resonating and assisting farmers to offset the ridiculous pressure that is coming from Liberal Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Later today, I will be debating my PMB Bill 191, Child Care and Early Years Workforce Strategy Advisory Committee Act. The bill seeks. Yeah, it's a very important day for child care workforce in this in, um, in this legislature. The bill seeks to address workforce issues impacting child care in Ontario, mainly the staffing shortages operators have been reporting. Families deserve to have affordable child care that they can rely on. Early childhood workers deserve jobs that they can turn into careers, and operators deserve a funding model that secures a future for child care. My question is to the Premier. Will this government commit to supporting my bill so Ontario families can access the child care in this province that they need? The Minister of Education. So the question is, will the Progressive Conservative government support an NDP plan that will preclude 30 percent of the market and 70,000 families outside of the program? The answer is no. Order. We can confirm it's a, it's a total no. Order. We will absolutely not support a program for which you will have literally made the problem you define in your question of waitlist worse. Profoundly worse. I mean, the opposition to the Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite want the government to sign on to a private member's bill, duplicative but fundamentally in its nature, to actually undermine choice of parents. Order. That is not a position supported by mainstream families who want their choices and how they raise Order. their kids to be supported. Nonprofit, for profit, home care, the government's policies to support them all. The members opposite should get on side. Supplementary question, the member for London West. On a child care wait list for two years. She was only able to return to work because she found home child care, and she and her husband adjusted their work schedules so that one can do the 8.30 drop-off and the other can do the 4.30 pickup. Gabrielle works at London Health Sciences Centre and told me that many nurses want to get back to work after their mat leaves, but they can't because they can't find childcare. Speaker, does this government understand that a childcare plan without a workforce strategy is not going to help women like Gabrielle get back into the labour market? Minister of Education. Take a step back, Speaker. We inherited a childcare program that costs on average $50 to $60, $50 to $60 a day. It was our government under our Premier's leadership that cut that by 50 per cent, saving six to $12,000 per child per year. We then committed to build spaces, 86,000 spaces, for which the government is on track, 41,000 spaces created since 2018. The member opposite speaks about supporting our staff. It was this government that just increased wages this year by 19 per cent in the first year, achieving wage parity with the ECs in kindergarten because, Mr. Speaker, that was a fundamental priority to, to reduce the exodus of staff going from childcare into our school system. We now have wage parity. We're increasing wages by $1 per hour, per year, every year. This is going to make a difference as we retain more workers, as we build more spaces, as we continue to reduce fees for the people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week the Premier announced that the government will be spending $225 million to introduce and expedite alcohol sales into convenience stores and gas stations. Meanwhile, in Northern Ontario, we continue to see opioid-related deaths rise. In fact, the North has three times the mortality rate from overdose compared with the rest of the province. Speaker, the priorities in Timmins, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, North Bay, Sioux Lookout, Elliott Lake, and every community across Northern Ontario is not a quicker access to alcohol. They would rather see these millions go towards supervised consumption sites and addiction centers that have been working for shoestring that have been working on shoestring budgets to save people's lives in Northern Ontario. Why is the Premier prioritizing alcohol sales over dying people from opioid overdoses? to respond, the Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, to the member opposite, thank you for that question. It's an important question, and it is something that is being addressed by this government in a very substantive way. 
When you think about the amount of investments that we're making, over $525 million in annualized investments, $90 million specifically focused on building treatment and recovery beds, withdrawal management, treatment beds, and supportive housing. All of these Order. investments are creating a continuum of care. Now, past governments, and I hear the, the cackling on the other side, let's just look and see what they did versus what we're doing. We are making investments in Northern Ontario because Northern Ontario needs significant investments. Order. Out of the investments that we've made, 54 per cent have gone to build 400 beds in the province, 7,000 treatment spots, with 54 per cent of them in Northern Ontario. We are building a continuum of care to help everyone in the province with all addictions. Order. The supplementary question. Again, to the Premier. Developmental services, rates, ODSP, OW, home care, unfunded hospitals, growing ER wait times, supervised consumption sites that are closing. These are the priorities that I hear from people across Algoma, Manitoulin and Northern Ontario. When I speak to people in my writing, they want to know what we are doing, uh, not what we're doing about a five minute wait at the liquor store, but what we're doing about a five hour wait time in the ER rooms. Speaker, this Premier is spending $225 million to expand alcohol sales while hospitals in Northern Ontario continue to struggle with inadequate funding from this government. Last week's press conference sounded like a lot of a campaign launch to me, Speaker. So I would like to know, does the Speaker plan to run on more alcohol being sold in Ontario, or does he plan on eventually addressing the health care crisis in Northern Ontario? Members will please take their seats. The Premier. All due respect to the member, he's worried about an early election. He should be worrying who you're running for as an independent? Are you voting for the Liberals? You're running for the NDP? That's what you have to determine, my friend, because you probably won't be here next uh, next round. But you know something? It, 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 Order. You know something, Mr. Speaker? Under the Liberals, the worst contract I have ever seen in business in 35 years. They were losing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars every single year. What we're doing, we're going to see new revenues of $895 million to $1.16 billion. That's hundreds of millions of dollars that we can put towards health care on top of the 30 percent increase we've already put to health care. We're going to make sure that we help people go to detox beds, rehabilitation Response. centers. That's where that money is going to be going. It's not going to be wasted like the Liberals and the worst contract I've ever seen. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. I'm going to say this. It's not helpful to speculate on the outcome of the next election in individual seats or the timing of the election, possibly. That doesn't add anything to the debate. The next question. The member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Mines. Oh, great minister. The Liberal carbon tax is punishing families and businesses in Northern Ontario by driving up costs and making life more unaffordable. That's true. To add insult to injury, the opposition members that represent Northern communities continue to support this harmful tax. No Speaker, the agriculture, forestry and mining sectors are all big job creators and economy builders in the North. They also happen to be the main targets for this NDP-backed Liberal cash grab. Unlike the opposition NDP and independent Liberals, our government continues to demonstrate support for the people and businesses in Northern Ontario. Here, here. We won't stop fighting until the federal government finally scraps that tax. Speaker, That's right. can the minister please explain the burden this harmful tax is putting Ontario's mining industry in? That's a to reply, the Minister of Mines. Thank you. Question for the uh, member from Peter Peterborough and Kawartha. Yeah. This starts with expiration, and expiration starts with flying air mag surveys or perhaps lighter surveys. Carbon tax, carbon tax. When they find something, they marshal the drills into the bush that are pitted, that are, that are pulled in skitters, heavily, heavily fuel dependent. Carbon tax. When it's, then it's from there it goes into camps. 
camps, it's, it's, it's then cord split. Then it goes to places like Lakefield in Peterborough and in places like Oakville. And what are they looking for? Critical minerals. Critical minerals that are the power of the EV revolution. And why do we need the EV revolution? To reduce the carbon footprint. Here, here. This tax is counterproductive. It should be scrapped. The Liberals and their partners Spons. and the NDP have to scrap this tax. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Business owners across Ontario continue to face financial challenges driven by the Liberal carbon tax. And mining businesses that drive major economic growth in this province are no exception. Speaker, we have the opportunity of a lifetime to build a supply chain for electric vehicles right here in Ontario that will fuel prosperity, create a better future for generations to come, and reduce our carbon footprint. Here, here. The Made in Ontario supply chain starts with mining, and the carbon tax is taking its toll on this process with more increased expenses. Speaker, everyone in this chamber knows that there is not a green economy without electric vehicles. Can the minister Question. please explain how the Liberal carbon tax is threatening Ontario's mining sector as well as our entire electric vehicle supply chain? Minister of Mines. Thanks again very much for the, uh, for the question. Mr. Speaker, we're very lucky that Ontario has the minerals to power the EV revolution. We've got nickel deposits in Timmins, like, uh, the, uh, uh, um, of course, that are, that are they're huge. The next round of uh, drilling will, of course, make Canada, Ontario, the, give, the, give us the highest nickel resource globally. Not only nickel do we have in Timmins, we have nickel in, 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 uh, in Sudbury and in the Ring of Fire. We don't want the nickel from Indonesia. The Indonesian nickel is it, it's, it's uh, financed by the Chinese, and the, it's powered by coal, and the tailings go right into the ocean. We don't want that nickel. We want the nickel from Ontario. So we're burdened. These companies are burdened by the carbon tax. And on top of that, we've got Brett Rurst in the ring of fire. So we secure the supply chain for, the, for our national de defense as well. Response. We've got the minerals to secure the supply chain from Northern Ontario into Southern Ontario. We have to scrap this talk tax, and the Liberals must scrap this tax. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Over the last four years, many of our small businesses have been abandoned. While this government was busy bailing out big box stores and granting funds to some businesses that weren't even located in Ontario, we called for a ban on all evictions by commercial landlords for the duration of the pandemic and a utility payment freeze for small and medium sized businesses to help them survive. A recent Better Way Alliance report on small businesses found some business owners had seen rent hikes of 10 percent, 50 percent, some of them doubled speaker from one year to the next. In 2022, we promised to create a standard commercial lease to help protect our small business owners. We've even called for rent control. My question is to the Premier. This government denied too many small businesses the support they needed during an unprecedented pandemic. Question. Today, what will you do to protect our small businesses and our commercial tenants? Thank you. Sorry, through the chair. The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I do want to thank the member opposite for the question because it does allow us to highlight some of the things that our government is doing to support our small businesses across the province. Just, just in the 2024 budget, we added an additional $6.8 million over the next two years for our small businesses, for those who want to start their businesses through this uh, Start a Company Plus program with grants of up to $5,000. For many of our young people who want to have a summer company program, and just yesterday, Minister of Labour, Training and Immigration and Skills Development had a young man, 16 years old, who was actually producing uh, freeze-dried fruits and ice cream. It was just a great opportunity that he was taking uh, one of the, the programs that we support. 
Our regional innovation centres are Spots. providing great services for those who wish to export their products. Our small business enterprise centres that are there on the ground helping people who have a great idea that want to get them off the ground. We're investing in women's futures and women's economic... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, over the weekend, we said goodbye to Oakwood Hardware, a small business in our community. Um, it was more than a restaurant. It was a gathering place where we all felt we belonged. Uh, many small businesses in St. Paul's, of course, like Oakwood Hardware, a family business deeply rooted in our community, are hurting. The affordability crisis has hit them, and it's hit their customers. It's hit the artists, the musicians, the single moms, the youth, everyone who call these businesses a part of their home, a part of their community. Premier, my question is to the Premier. Will you take a moment today to extend your condolences to Oakwood Hardware and a number of other small businesses, families in Midtown, in Little Jamaica, and across Ontario question. that have had to see their doors shutter during your tenure? Thank you. Again, I'll remind members to make their comments to the chair, the Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker. I do want to once again thank the member opposite. Um, yes, many, many businesses are struggling, but there is one thing that the member opposite, her party, the provincial Liberal Party can do. They can call on their federal counterparts to scrap the carbon tax, which is adding massive expenses to all of our businesses across East province. It's hurting our growth. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade travels this world and brings amazing investments into Ontario. But, um, Minister of Colleges and Universities, the Minister of Agriculture and I were just in Indiana talking about how we can attract more businesses to come here, start and grow. And we're having tremendous success. But you know what hurts all of that? The federal carbon tax. So once again, we ask you, stand with us, call on your federal wants. counterparts and tell them to scrap the tax today. The next question, the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Ontarians have had enough of the Liberal carbon tax. It is driving up the cost of daily necessities for communities across the province, especially in the North. Speaker, it's unfair that individuals and families in Northern Ontario are being hit hardest at the gas pumps as well as at the grocery stores. And it's even more unfair that the opposition members representing these communities are ignoring their own constituents and supporting a punitive tax. The federal government needs to listen to Ontarians and get rid of that carbon tax today. Here, here. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how the Liberal carbon tax is driving up costs for Northern communities. Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Constituency Week, as everyone knows, started with uh, the May long weekend, and me and my little girls uh, have a ritual. We jump in the water no matter what the temperature is. It was 49 degrees. Shocking to the system. Proud of those little girls for taking that jump. But similarly, uh, boaters and the likes were shocked at the price of gas for their boats and for their quads. These aren't just features of tourism and relaxing on the lakes and cottages. These are forms of transportation for the people in my riding, Mr. Speaker. So the repining persists, Mr. Speaker. Most people describe this tax as a royal pain. And they want the king of the carbon tax and the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, to do what we want to do, and that's scrap the tax. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being no further business.